The jury will not be sequestered. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. In the Weinstein case, fellow silence breakers and any selection is moving along here. I'll read the verdict, says the Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. We don't tend to see it as raw as this. Good evening and welcome. All right, welcome back to Law & Crime Networks for the record. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be taking it at the 3 o'clock. As you know, Mark Redwine, we've been covering this case gavel to gavel. The jury is receiving the instructions right now before closing arguments. You can watch it on the Law & Crime Network or the Law & Crime Network's YouTube channel. And also, Robert Durst, about to begin around 12, uh, 12, 15 Eastern Standard Time, the 78-year-old on trial for the killing of Susan Berman, the alleged motive that she was going to rat him out with respect to the disappearance of his wife, Kathy Durst, from decades before. So kind of an amazing case here. One of the last witnesses we had on the witness stand was uh, Susan Giordano, who is discussing how she met Robert Durst. Let's take a listen. Now, I want to go way back, and I want you to tell us, how did you and Bob Durst originally meet? Way back, I started working at an ad agency, and I did want to meet Mr. Durst, and there's a mutual friend that we had. And... Um, let me stop you. Who's the mutual friend? Um, Nick Chavin. Nick and I worked at the same agency. I didn't work for him at the time. So I knew Nick Chavin, and I wanted to meet Bob Durst. I was single, and I wanted to meet with him. Um, Bob was very busy at the time. Uh, so it, it took me a very long time. When he was in Texas, I finally wrote to him, reminded wait, him. Wait, who I want to stop you, man. I was. The time that you're describing, when was this approximately? What year when you first, first met him? First time I wanted to go out was 1987. And how old were you back then? I was 21. And fair to say Mr. Durst would have been 44, is that right? Yes. And you had an interest in Mr. Durst, is that correct? Yes. Did you know that Mr. Durst was wealthy? <laughs> Not at 21, no. 21, no. I don't... Uh, didn't really. I just knew he was a friend of Nick and he was a client. And that was it. So you're working at this ad agency with Nick Chavin. Yes. And you agree that Nick and Bob were very close friends, correct? Yes. And you had an interest in dating Mr. Durst, but you had no idea at the time that Mr. Durst was from one of the wealthiest families in all of New York. <laughs> That's right. When did you learn that he was as wealthy as he is? when I wanted to go out with him. I must have been, it was a few years later. I mean, I was in the art department, so I didn't do any financials, and there was a lot of clients, so that's it. I was the art person. Did, did you know when you first met Bob Durst, did you know that his wife had disappeared? Yes. Okay, that's a prosecutor asking questions on direct examination. I have with me today Gabriela uh, uh, Teresa Gonzalez, also known as uh, my good friend uh, Gigi. Gabriela, I love that name, Gigi. Uh, and I love Gigi too, so they're, they're both great names. So let Thank me ask you, you so Gigi. <laughs> yeah, so what, what is the purpose of this in your mind as to why the prosecutor is calling this witness? You know, maybe to see how manipulative Robert Durst can be. Um, but I got to be honest with you, this witness seemed really aloof. Uh, the fact that she didn't even know the Durst family, who has been around for decades before her as a very successful family, the fact that she seemingly did not know about the disappearance of Kathy Durst all of these years. I mean, I don't know how well she serves either size, side because she seems pretty incredible to me. You know, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about this case, Gigi, and I think I've talked to you about it, and I know that other guests and hosts have as well, is that the prosecutor is throwing a lot of stuff out there, mentioning the age, how old were you, how old was he. Um, evidence needs to be the first rule, right, Gigi, that the teacher in law school, relevant, relevant to a material fact that's at dispute in the trial. Um, so first, it's got to pass the relevancy standard and then <laughs> there's another rule that says you just can't be piling on a bunch of bad character evidence 
that poisons the jurors' minds with regard to the specific facts of the case here. What is the relevance of this testimony? Yeah, that's a really great question. As far as this witness con is concerned, I'm not sure what the relevance is. And if it's relevant, it's relevant to the defense because, you know, why would she seemingly go after this man who is accused of, uh, you know, making his wife disappear or is a prime suspect in his wife's disappearance? Uh, you know, I don't think it's relevant for the state to bring up this case. I don't know what the age difference is, how it plays into Susan Berman's murder. I don't know what this witness says as far as figuring out whether or not Robert Durst is responsible for Susan Berman's uh, uh, death. And this testimony is definitely going to be more prejudicial than it is probative. You know, uh, Gigi, when I was a young pup as a prosecutor, uh, my uh, people, my elders, some of whom had the philosophy that throw everything up against the wall and see what sticks. I mean, you used to hear that. These were the people that typically <laughs> never won cases. Um, but nevertheless, uh, my, my better, what I'll call mentors, told us to be surgical and strategic with the manner in which witnesses go on. Do you think? that despite the fact that it's creating appellate issues in the case down the road, a la Cosby, right? That appellate court says that this stuff was completely irrelevant and nothing but pure character assassination. But do you think a juror, just one, it's all defense needs, just one, and as a prosecutor, I'd be worried about it, is gonna sit there and say, this is all they got? We're listening to all these witnesses that have no, they won't use the term relevance or perhaps they will, but not in a legal sense. This, this, the, the, there must be nothing burger here if this is what they have to resort to. Is there a possibility of that blowback on the prosecutor? Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, Bob, you're still a young pup, so don't discredit yourself. But that was a common <laughs> phrase in law school, too. If you don't know what the uh, the call of the question is, just throw all of the material you can onto the paper and see what points you get. And usually those were the students that were not at the top 10 of their class. You know what I mean? So, you know, when you have a prosecutor that's throwing everything against the wall to see what sticks, yeah, something may stick. But here you have a, a child that's been going on for weeks, for for months and these jurors are tired and you're for sure going to get I think more than one saying what is the point of hearing this testimony this uh, person who is uh, admiring Robert Durst from afar and wanted to date him what does that have to do with the case in hand what does that have to do with Su Susan Berman's murder and I think well, that you're going to get a lot more than one juror saying that yeah, kind of prescient. Like, what does it have to do with anything? Like, also, some of the testimony that the prosecutor... Remember, this is the prosecutor's witness. And in a weird way, it seems like a lot of times he's trying to impeach his own witnesses or whatever. It's very kind of cloudy to me, where he talks about whether she had a financial motivation in order to be involved with Robert Durst. Uh, Gigi, take a listen to this and tell me what's going on here. Would you agree that as you sit up here today testifying that you have a financial motivation to keep yourself in good graces with Bob Durst. No, I, it's unconditional, it really is unconditional, it's not. Okay, listen to my question though, ma'am. Sure. I'm not asking you what it is that's causing you to do, to testify, et cetera. I'm merely asking you, would you Objection, go? Your Honor, she's testifying because I think we got a subpoena. Wait, well, what? I don't understand the objection, but she did actually answer the question, Mr. Lewin. Yeah. She, she answered it and she gave an explanation. Okay, ma'am? Yes. <clears throat> How much money has Bob Durst given you over the years? Over the years? Yeah. 300,000. In February of 2015, right before his arrest, he sent you a check for $38,000, correct? I, I'm gonna actually say, believe it or not, I don't remember. I, if you testified previously, or if you stated previously that you had been sent $38,000 in February of 2015, would that be accurate? If I, yeah, I, I just right now. Ma'am, in yeah. March of 2015, did Bob Durst send you another check, this time for $300,000? Yes. So when you said he's giving you $300,000, ma'am, a moment ago I said, how much has he given you in total? And you said $300,000. Ma'am, that's incorrect, right? Okay. I forgot about the 38. It's well, probably for my son, so, yeah. I would... 
Well, let's continue, ma'am. He sent you one check for $300,000. Trust me, I'm going to go through all of it. But he mm -hmm. sent you one check in 2015 in March for $300,000. Mm -hmm. He's continued to send you money up until very recently. Is that correct? I have not received the check. What? I have not received the check. I have. Nope. So, ma'am, so there's been no payments. I'll get there. There have been no payments by Mr. Durst or his representatives in the last two years. Regarding Honestly, I don't know. I gave some of the bills that I had that were old bills that had to be paid, and I gave them to my attorney. That's what I did. I gave them to my attorney, and I still get them, and my bills are still a little late. <laughs> but, um, Ma'am, do you have an attorney who you just give bills to and he pays them? He told me to hand over what I owe, and some of it was paid and some of it wasn't. Well, and I didn't ask. I didn't ask. Honestly, I well, didn't ask. I didn't see a check. I see that it's still a couple of months late, some of it, but I didn't ask and I didn't see any money pass through my hands. Not a check, nothing in, since whatever you said, 2015. I asked you originally how much has he sent you, and I want to include your family in total. So I'm going to ask that again. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to try to think right now, in total, how much money has Bob Durst either directly or indirectly given to you or your family members, in total? Um, I don't, I, I, I don't, I, well, maybe there was, uh, 15,000 more in my, in the bills that I had. I, he didn't, I really don't know exactly. I mean, I don't. Um, at the time that Mr. Durst sent you that $300,000 check, he told you he was going to send that to you in advance of his arrest, correct? I really don't remember. <clears throat> Honestly, I don't remember. I didn't, didn't know he was getting arrested either, to be honest with you. So until Andrew Jarecki called me, other than that, I didn't know he said he was going to send me something. OK, so I'd love to have commentary with Gigi about that, but we can't do that because they're live. And as you know, if they're live, we're live. Let's go to court. Uh, yes, I did. And is that uh, agreeable to you? Yes. Can, so can, uh, we, um, we are going to come in on, uh, originally on Monday, there, there was a concern about starting that we would not be able to start at nine, but the lawyers uh, are on the, looks like they're gonna have a stipulation as to that legal issue that was going to require a long hearing. They're going to reach agreement. I expect to approve their agreement. And that means we'll start right on time at nine o'clock. The more time we get in, the sooner we finish. So I, I, that's why I try to uh, encourage this. So, uh, so strike. On your, on your calendars, uh, be sure that uh, next Monday you come in at 9 o'clock. So thank, thank you. you. And uh, with that, let's, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's be here now and uh, resume the examination of uh, this witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Ma'am, I want to go back to an area that we discussed yesterday. Do you remember I asked you about a call that took place on September 20th, 2017? Um, this was seven months after you testified at the motion, and I asked yesterday if you recalled asking Bob Durst for $30,000 for a second car for your son, Tommy, and your response was, that did not happen, correct? Correct. And then I also asked you if you discussed on that same call if Mr. Durst mentioned a concern he had that if he gave you money, that it could be viewed as, and he used the word bribe, and you said that he did not use the word bribe. That never happened, correct? I don't remember. I really don't. Code SG118. Your Honor, do we, well, Mr. Milley, bring that up. Do we, was the court able to um, fix the heating issue or no? Clearly, claim complete responsibility for our gradual uh, improvement. It, it's uh, no, it's uh, I, I don't know. They, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it it, it uh, apparently they, they found the problem 
and we're, we're trying to, I understood it was better. Maybe it's just me. Am I the only one that's still hot right now? Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's definitely hotter than it was. May I have permission uh, to take my coat off, Your Honor? Can... No? Okay. <laughs> you know, Erica, really, I rely on Erica to, to help me with decisions like that. So. Wait, what, what, I didn't hear. What did she say? She's, uh, she said it was okay. Okay, thank, thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Overruling Mr. Balian's objection. <laughs> All right. Um, there was, I know there were. I th there was a technician uh, in the in the hallway. I overheard him, but I, apparently it's much worse. It's emanating from that side of the building. So yesterday in the morning that was impossible, and by by late afternoon that heat had moved in this direction, and it was getting worse and worse. There. I know we're trying to get some cross ventilation now to mitigate it, but obviously it's not entirely fixed. So, uh, Mr. Lewin, you may. I think they're trying. Ready? You know what I'm going to do? You can go to the I'm next subject. Go to, area. go to a different area. Okay, I'm going to move to a different area. Yes. He's in trouble when he's asking me for any protective home. All right, while they're uh, debating the heat and the prosecutor is obviously needs to take his jacket off, let's take a quick break here at the Law Crime Network and we'll be right back. Stay with us, please. All right, the uh, prosecutor is examining Ms. Giordano and talking about things that Robert Durst wanted to get her because things weren't going well after episode five. Let's take a listen to court. He Guys, just, can you cut I out the, ear, the trial of my questions. ear? He speaking? literally said, I just want to come home to New York. So, so during the call, Mr. Durst in no way communicated to you that he was fleeing Houston. He was just telling you, I'm going to come visit you in New York? Um, just, yes. I'm, I'm coming to New York. It was a brief conversation. Um, I'm sure you've seen <laughs> how long the conversation was pretty quick. Um, that was it. Ma'am, and you're aware that Mr. Durst has since been interviewed and that he has said that he was fleeing Houston and that he was going to go to Cuba, correct? I, I, I... Sure, I'm going to object. What's the, what's the basis? Ground. Ground. Succinctly. Facts, not in evidence. Right? <clears throat> okay. Um, I'll need an offer of proof. I'm sorry, Your okay. We'll go sidebar. All right, Gigi, while they're at sidebar, so we see why I guess the prosecutor is calling this witness with regard to consciousness of guilt. Um, evidence. What are your thoughts about that? Because, you know, he calls the witness and he's doing a lot of basically cross-examining like it's a hostile witness. I'd ask the producers whether or not the person's been declared as a hostile witness and we don't believe that she was. Nevertheless, um, I believe that's the kind of information he wants to get out. Again, going back to these are things that innocent people wouldn't do, but Durst was asking her to do. Thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. And this wouldn't be the first witness that the prosecutor brings forward and ends up uh, declaring hostile. Um, but it's definitely, you know, the point of consciousness of guilt. That's definitely where the state is trying to go with this witness to ascertain whether or not Robert Durst was actually trying to flee uh, to go visit her, you know, and whether her conception of that, you know, is either she's lying or she really is this aloof. Uh, so far, she seems really aloof, but it's really hard to explain, for example, how she doesn't know about the money coming into her account. And these are big sums of money, $30,000, $300,000. And the fact that she doesn't really know much about it and now acting like, you know, she doesn't really understand why Robert Durst would need coats, uh, you know, it definitely lends itself to be a suspicious witness here. Gigi, uh, in the end analysis, though, could, could the jurors or one juror, that singular juror, say, look, Robert Durst is an odd guy. Is Robert Durst, who said he's going to take the witness stand, saying, I've been hunted for decades over this. It, it's not a question that just show that I'm guilty. It's just that I know what's about to come down, and I don't want it to come down. So I'm going to do whatever I can to evade authorities, go to Cuba, do whatever I got, go on the run, 
Um, would this be the reaction maybe of a normal person, keeping in mind that Robert Thur seriously, uh, seriously in front of this jury, I don't think poses himself to be even <laughs> normal. Yeah, I don't think he's ever going to be found normal by any reasonable group of people. Um, but here, you know, yeah, I'm sure there are going to be juror, uh, at least one juror that says, you know, they haven't been able to charge him for this crime, you know, in years. And it was only after the edited footage of his confession came out that they were able to land these charges on him. I think that there are going to be jurors that ask, why do you need all of these witnesses to establish uh, this fact that Robert Durst uh, killed uh, Susan Berman? Why do you have to go into the disappearance of Kathy Durst and the trial of uh, Morris Black in order to create this narrative or to reach this conclusion that he was a part of Susan Berman's murder? Well, of course, the prosecutor will try to tie that in, that the fear that the... Uh that they were going to go to Susan Berman and reinitiate the investigation with that, with respect to Kathy Durst's disappearance decades before uh, would be the motivating factor in this case as to why he killed Susan Berman, no? No, absolutely. Um, you know, and that's definitely what ties together the entire theory, except for the fact, and correct me if I'm wrong, they didn't even have, it was a rumor that she was going to go speak to investigators, but they didn't even have a date set for her to go speak to investigators. Yeah, so over, overall, if you, were, if you were defending this case, are you feeling good you've got some good argu arguments to make in summation about how the prosecutor is putting the case in, or are you nervous? Which side would you rather be on it? The lawyer gods came down and said, Gigi, you get to have the prosecutor's case or the defense case. Which one are you picking? I'm always going to pick the defense side. I don't think that I, I wouldn't be able to return home if I picked the state attorney side, quite frankly, uh, with a criminal defense lawyer dad. <laughs> but, you know, I think that the defense attorney, they definitely are nervous. But again, the fact that the state attorney has you know, had to put on a case for weeks on end, the fact that the jurors may start to feel a little bit anxious and a little bit you know, disconnected from this case already, a little bit more focused on what they're going to do after this trial is over, it's definitely benefiting the defense. And also the fact, again, that the only reason that we're sitting here in trial is because of this jinx documentary. So if they're able to do a really good job at tearing down the credibility of the producers and to establish the fact that his confession was actually doctored, the defense may have a chance here. Yeah, so is this the the activities and rantings of a weird guy trying to obscure things, but not for a nefarious reason, but because he's just kooky? Or what about in 2015, some information that prosecutors and police were able to seize with respect to Ms. Oh, unfortunately, I'm being told by the producers, we can't get to that clip of boxes that were actually in her possession uh, that Robert Durst gave her over 60 boxes, because we are back live in court. Let's go to it. $30,000 second car and the use of the word bribe. That's going to be uh, SG118-92017. Mr. Milius, the uh, exhibit numbers. Ma'am? Yes. That's your voice, correct? Yes. So the first thing is, Mr. Durst mentioned that he gave you $50,000 a year ago. 
That is separate from the 300. No. So you're saying that's the that's the same. That's yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, and you said it's all gone. Yes. So, ma'am, I thought you said that you put the rest of the money. I think you said maybe a hundred thousand dollars was to cover uh, loan and tuitions for the kids. What happened to the other two hundred thousand? I I had it written down actually, uh, and I had sent it. So it was. The hundred thousand with credit cards. I, I mean, then I had forty thousand put towards the other property. So I wrote everything down, and then it was Louisiana. I had put, I don't know, it was like, I don't know exactly if it was the thirty thousand. Tommy's apartment there. I. He was in Louisiana or LSU at the time, um, and he set him with an apartment. Ma'am, did you buy? Did you buy a house in Mr. Durst's name with that money? Uh, no, we paid the architect. We paid out, and then the deal fell through. Right. So it was a loss of about, I don't know, it was a loss of about 35000 between the architect and the engineer. And so you got $350,000 from Bob Rumble. You spent about $35,000 on lost cost, and then the rest of it went to support your and your children's standard of living, correct? Yes, it was to pay up what was owed, yes. I don't so, so what kind of second car did Tommy need that was going to cost $30,000? It, it wasn't. The conversation prior was other things that were involved. Well, so. ma'am, isn't it true? You hit, you hit Bob up on this call. You basically said, hey, uh, how about thirty? Right, as a total for whatever, but it certainly wasn't a secondhand car for thirty thousand. Well, I would think it wouldn't be a secondhand no. car. Maybe a so, secondhand uh, no. uh, Lamborghini, but no. not a secondhand car anybody else would drive. No, and it's, if you actually look, I mean, my newest car is a two thousand four. If you want did, to be did, technical, <laughs> did you actually buy that one, or was that a gift from Mr. Durs? No, I bought the you bought that one four. So, ma'am. You also mentioned that, that there's no way that bribery came up during this I, call. You said that yesterday. Do you see Mr. Durst talking about that? Yes, I, I, I do. I wasn't either paying attention. I don't know. I don't remember. And, ma'am, that's not the only time that you and Mr. Durst have had conversations about the idea that if he called you as a witness or if you testified as a witness, that the monies that you had been paid would make it look like he bribed you. Correct? I did, yes. Let me ask, is it your position, ma'am, you said that you were an unbiased witness, correct? Yes. Do you think that the $350,000 that Bob has given you, do you think that in any way is a factor that it would be reasonable for the jury to weigh in assessing your credibility? No. Okay. Um, let me continue, ma'am. So we were talking about a moment ago the issue of Mr. Durst telling you that he was uh, fleeing. Do you recall that line of questioning? I recall. So, ma'am, you have seen. Hey, Ms. Giordano is still on the stand by the prosecutor, called by the prosecutor on direct examination. Let's take a quick break here in the Long Crime Network. We'll be right back. All right, while we were on the break, the prosecutor throwing a gauntlet down. Let's just put this into context. Susan Giordano is a longtime friend of Robert Durst. At the sidebar that we were talking about before, apparently right in front of the jury, they fist pumped one another uh, as an indication of friendship with one another. The prosecutor probably didn't see that, but I'm sure some of his folks did. Nevertheless, the prosecutor is getting into the idea that she had a key and he was asking her to get suitcases filled with clothes because, quote, you were attempting to aid and abet him from fleeing from justice. There was an objection. Let's go back to court. So let's talk about specifically what he was saying about the jinx. What did he tell you when the first episode of the jinx aired? He asked me if I watched it. I um, Honestly, he never said anything negative. He just asked me if I watched it. And had you watched it? I did watch the first episode. And 
ma'am, would you agree that historically, if I were to, on a level of one to 100, with one being Bob Durst has no interest at all in articles or interviews about him, and 100 mean he's obsessed and wants every interview and every story about him, where would Bob Durst be? I, w I would say in the middle. I think it's mostly curiosity. I, I, what other people viewed it, I guess. But ma'am, isn't it true that nearly every time there's anything that appears in a paper or on TV that Mr. Durst calls you and is asking you to watch it, to find it, to send it to him? Most of the time, he wants me to watch it. So, but you're just calling that an average interest. You said in the middle. Yes, I mean, yes. So you go to pick up these suitcases. Do you ask him what's inside? No. Do you pack the suitcases? Yes. So what do you put inside the suitcases? Uh, I literally didn't pack neatly. I kind of threw just a few items and a pair of shoes, a shirt, and a sweater, um, the shoes. Did, did he tell you where these empty suitcases were? Yes. And where were these empty suitcases? In his closet. Okay, so you picked up, there's a red and a green suitcase, both empty in the closet, is that right? Yes. And then you packed them, is that correct? Correct. Um, which one did you send him? Um, red? You sent him the red one. Okay. Let me, uh, let me put these up now. I think so. People's next in order. 217, Your Honor. 217, yes. Ma'am, is this the suitcase that you picked up? Yes. And, so. and you packed that, and you said, what did you put inside? Um, just, I think, just shoes, uh, like a couple of shirts. I, it was really quick. Uh, my sure. call was running outside, so it was really quick. Marking 218. Ma'am, do you know what that is? They're envelopes. What's up? They're envelopes. Appear to be envelopes. Oh, I have one behind me. Okay. It's in front of you. Yes. Well, this be yes. Uh, um, envelopes. What do I need? You can look at that. That's yeah, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, I want you to assume, ma'am, mm -hmm. that when that suitcase was opened, mm -hmm. underneath the clothes, and the shoes were those envelopes. Objection, Your Honor. What, grounds? Yep. What? Um, Overruled. I was about to say something, Your Honor, but okay. Tell me again. Facts not in evidence, Your Honor. Um, Overruled. Okay. Ma'am. Yes. I want you to assume for a moment that those envelopes contain roughly a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. That they were inside the suitcase when the FBI opened it. That's what do you, I was told. Do you know how that got there? I would assume it was in there. I didn't put it in there. Well, ma'am, you just testified that you took two empty suitcases and you put clothes inside. I did. I just threw everything in. Like I said, my car was running. I was wishing a video. I was in there for probably three minutes, and I threw some stuff in, and I ran before I would get to it. So, ma'am. Let me show I didn't you. Know what papers, honestly, in there? I didn't know. I even told the FBI agent that. People's 218. 219, excuse me, ma'am. When you open the envelope, wow. okay. do you see that? Was that in the suitcase when you packed it? Did not look through anything. You would not see a fingerprint, a t nothing on there, because I didn't touch anything. 220. We did. Fingerprint, DNA, there is nothing I touched. It's a lot of cash, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, ma'am, can you explain how 
roughly $115,000 worth of cash, got into an empty suitcase that you yourself had testified you packed. Like I said, if it was in there and there were papers in there already, I didn't go through any papers. I didn't touch. You could fingerprint, DNA, whatever you like. I did not touch those envelopes. Ma'am, that's why I asked you first if they were empty twice. I, I, I didn't. It was dark. I was in his apartment. Don't argue. Ma'am? No, so, you. Yeah, you, ma'am, you, tes <laughs> you testified, ma'am, that the suitcases were empty, correct? You just testified to that five minutes ago, is that right? Yes, I didn't look in the bottom. It was a tall suitcase. I literally was in the building. If there was a video for three minutes, I up on my life. I took a few things. I, you could, they were neatly packed. I threw them in there. And I left. And if there were papers in there, I'm sorry I didn't look. Ma'am, I just want to ask you. I would have overnighted. Ma'am, you're saying that's what happened, correct? Yes, that is what happened. I, I want to ask you, if you were listening to that story yourself. Objection, you're on 352. If I can finish my question, as the court has okay, said. I'll, I'll hear it, then I'll consider it for 352. Ma'am. Yes. Would you agree, ma'am, that even if your position is that that's what happened, that in listening to the story, it does not sound very reasonable. Uh, overruled. No. Uh. So to you, it sounds like a reasonable story that you took an empty suitcase that had nothing in it, that you packed it yourself, and that $115,000 turned up in that suitcase underneath the clothing, but you didn't know it was there. That sounds reasonable to you. It's reasonable because it's what happened. OK, Matt. Uh, and your position is that Mr. Durst didn't pack anything you packed at all. You've previously testified, correct? I'm exactly right. I put clothes. I didn't look at the bottom of the suitcase. And if there were papers in there, I would have thought they were papers. I didn't look through anything. Ma'am, you saw the number of envelopes, correct? I, excuse me? So let, I, me sh let me show I, you again, ma'am. Now I see envelopes like that. I mean, it looked. Ma'am? Okay. You're telling me that you missed that in the suitcase? If there was, like I said, if I thought there were papers in it, I certainly wasn't going to go through it. I don't remember because it was dark. I threw things in there, and that, that was it. I didn't go through anything. I didn't question him what was in it. I just what? sent it. But well, that's a fact that we've not heard before. You're now saying it was dark. Did well, you yeah. pack, so did you dark. pack the stuff in the dark? You didn't turn on the Well, it was very dim. Dim. <laughs> Could you see what you were doing, or were you kind of just... Objection, well, Your Honor. 352, cumulative. I just wanted to get out of the apartment, so I literally, for three minutes, and if there were papers in there that he didn't need, he could just throw them out. I didn't look. They could have been receipts for all I know. I didn't look through anything. I told you that. You could have done anything. Okay, ma'am. And there's not a trace of me in there. So, ma'am, and... According to instructions, then, you then mailed, sent, took this package over to, uh, to, uh, can't find it here, uh, to UPS, excuse me, and you sent it to Bob Durst in New Orleans. Is that right? Yes. Actually, um, I didn't actually pack it. I left it there for them to pack it. I left the suitcase on the counter and I left. Well, well, when you say you left them to pack it, yeah, I, m meaning you just gave them all the loose things inside and handed I it to them? I gave the man there the suitcase. I left it there. I said, do you box and do all of that? And he said, yes. I said, can you do that for me? And he said, yes, I'll pack it and box it and send it. So, so I your, left it on the counter. So it's your position, ma'am, that you gave the UPS guy Yes. Envelopes that contained $115,000, and he just packed them up for you? Objection, Your Honor. Yeah. States facts. The, the witness did not testify. She said she left That's the suitcase. That's not an objection, Your Honor. That's a speaking objection. Which the court has said it. The court doesn't want Okay, maybe if Mr. Lewin could go back to the lecture. Okay, while they hash this out and the arguments about her continued testimony, Mr. Giordano, let's take a quick break. Very interesting. We'll be right back.
during the break, Susan Giordano is on the witness stand. Prosecutor pressing her, essentially saying she was a participant aiding and abetting Robert Durst in his flight from justice. Let's take a listen in court. Very interesting. I need my winter clothes, but I'm coming up to New York. I'm in New Orleans. Do you know if it was winter or snowing in New Orleans at the time or no? No, I didn't know it was either. No. So he tells you I need my winter clothes, but he's also coming to New York. And then he says, send him the suitcases. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, pick them up and then send it to a phony name. One of the names I use. Well, Did not that particular name. I just never heard that name before, but I also didn't know he used to live there. So I don't know if he's with somebody else or he just wants to use a name. Just don't question it because it's Bob. Right. Well, ma'am, <laughs> ma'am, it's Bob, and Bob sends you a lot of money, and you're not going to question anything he tells you, are you? I don't, I don't really, I don't think I would question anybody. We have very, it was a very brief conversation. Gave me an address and a name, and asked me to do it, and I did it. Do, do you know who Everett Ward is? I don't know. Did you ask Mr. Durst, hey, why am I sending it to somebody named Everett Ward? Nope. Made a conversation. Ma'am, ma were you not aware at the time that Everett Ward was the name of the individual that is in testimony in this case that actually bought the bow saw from Farmers Marine at Chalmers uh, back in 2001? No, I didn't know. Sorry. Were you aware that Mr. Durst was actually registered at the JW Marriott under that alias as well? No, I didn't know. So, all right, so you send this down there, and, ma'am, it just so happens then that the, the money that you were not aware was there happened to be hidden under the clothes and the shoes. That was just coincidence? Yes. So you grab the clothes and tennis shoes. You, I just want to be clear. You're not disputing that the money was inside there, correct? I just want to make sure that we... You're not disputing that, are you? No. I okay. No. So the money is inside all those envelopes full of cash, $115,000 approximately. You don't notice them, but you previously testified that the suitcases were empty twice. And then you throw shoes and clothes on top of it. And it just so happens that those shoes and clothes happen to kind of cover up the money. That's just coincidence? Yes. Okay. So. You mail it down to Bob Durst. I'm sorry, well, you mail it down to Everett Ward. Um, did you check with Mr. Durst? Did you ask him, by the way, if there were two suitcases, what did you put in the other one? A little more clothes. Is there any money in the other one? I didn't look. The, um, Eric, uh, FBI agent, uh, Eric Perry, took it. So I really don't remember what was in that other one. So, Afterwards, you end up turning over, eventually, the second suitcase to the FBI, is that right? Yes, he was there that day. And ma'am, do you remember exactly, as you sit here, do you remember specifically what you did and how you arranged the items in the suitcase? No, I don't. It wasn't neat. SG036, Your Honor. 222. This is going to be from. All right, Gigi, listen, I mean, you know, it's very difficult to second guess things that are going on during a trial because the prosecutor knows all the information and the defense lawyer and what they want to try to accomplish. But with respect to this witness, prosecutors drew on serious blood here on many different areas. First off, the credibility, believability. He's very good at crossing. He doesn't really argue with them that much. His questions pretty much tell the jury exactly what it is he wants them to think. She's got this suitcase. She doesn't recognize there's envelopes in it, puts stuff on top. It's got $115,000 in cash. I got to ask you, why is she not taking the Fifth Amendment when the prosecutor is accusing her of aiding and abetting? Oh, I was just thinking the same thing, Bob. I'm sure her lawyer is pulling out his own hair like, I told you to plead the fifth in this situation. Don't answer these questions. I mean, she is just setting herself up for a really nasty uh, situation here. And the prosecutor seems like he's enjoying it. And we're questioning whether or not this is relevant. Mm -hmm. 
this is definitely relevant because it's looking like she right. really did try to aid and abet uh, Robert Durst in this situation. Now, what I'm told in pretrial hearings, the prosecutor said, well, the statute of limitation expired from the 2017 interview she gave. Well, maybe that's true, but she's testifying right now and literally being accused of aiding and abetting. If I were the defense attorney, I'd be screaming bloody murder. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to For the Record. My name is Bob Bianchi. In case you're just joining us right now, longtime friend uh, Susan Giordano is on the witness stand, called by the prosecution, although the prosecutors are aggressively going after her, essentially saying that she was aiding and abetting Robert Durst and his flight from law enforcement by packing suitcases, one of which had $150,000 in envelopes that she said she never saw as she laid clothes and shoes on top of it. Just to round out the conversation we had before the break, in 2017, she gave testimony and her defense lawyer, that is Ms. Giordano's, was concerned about her right to remain silent because she could be implicated in a crime. The prosecutor countered that the statute of limitations, which usually is five years, had expired, so she doesn't have to worry about being charged with a crime. But that doesn't cover the testimony she's giving right now, where the prosecutor literally said to her that she was aiding and abetting Robert Durst. Should the defense lawyer stand up, ask for a sidebar, and say this testimony ends? It certainly is and happening because she's still under the prosecutor's examination. Let's go live to court on this really interesting issue. Recollection? What's your exhibit is that? It says March 12th. Does that sound about right? And that's, uh, we're about to show yes, uh, 221. Yeah, yes, it was, uh, I know it was a couple of days before I actually got everything sent out and I spoke to him, but. So there's you, correct? And there's where you sent it, is that right? Yes. And there's already been a stipulation that Bob Durst was arrested on March 14th. So you're sending this on March 12th. Do you agree? Um, okay, yes. So, ma'am, if you're saying, you're telling Detective Becerra when he asked you when your last contact with Bob Durst was, and you're talking about episode five, how come you don't tell him that I just talked to Bob Durst and I just sent him a package? Well, I spoke to him, but quite a few days before then. It was a, you know, it just took me a long time to get to, to Manhattan. And then I didn't go to the place right away. I was gonna go to UPS. I was first gonna pack it, and then I waited a couple of days. And then, so yeah, I, I spoke to Bob after that, that I know. I'm gonna get to that in a minute, but my yeah. question is, why didn't you tell Investigator Becerra that you sent Bob a suitcase and that you had spoken to him. Did you just forget? No, because that was a week before I, I, I spoke to him. So I mean, it just took me a little bit to get there. It wasn't around the corner. I... Ma'am, you actually spoke to Bob, you have said, the day that he was arrested, correct? Yes, I, I believe so. So, ma'am, if you sent this on March 12th, if you spoke to Bob on March 14th, the day he was arrested, how come when Joe Becerra interviewed you only two days later on the 16th. How come you're telling him that the last time you spoke or had contact with Bob Durst was after episode five, which occurred, ma'am, on March 8th? Can you explain that? Um, no. No, no. Ma'am, how come? I don't even remember speaking to Bob the day he was arrested, so I, I, I don't remember that. Um... Ma'am, how come you didn't tell Investigator Becerra that you had sent Bob Durst a suitcase? He didn't ask me if I sent him anything. I don't know. I don't know. So I didn't speak to Bob, though, for a, a, a week before that. I mean, we didn't speak. So, ma'am, it's your position that you were not trying to hide the fact that you had sent this suitcase full of money because number one, you didn't know there was money in there and number two, you weren't trying to hide it. Is that your testimony? Yes. I, I didn't know there was, anyone was even really looking for him. Ma'am, isn't it, isn't it true that you didn't mention the suitcase at all until March 18th, two days after Investigator Becerra, when you were interviewed by Special Agent Eric Perry of the FBI. Is that true? 
That's true. And isn't it, isn't it true, ma'am, that even then, you didn't mention it until Agent Perry told you the following, quote, I can't stress enough that you need to be crystal clear with me right now about what you did and what you tried and what stuff you sent to Bob, because what I have in here isn't going to look very good for you, okay? So, you, so why don't you tell me about the last thing that you sent to Bob and when? That's at page 42, line 21 to page 43, line 2. Do you recall that conversation? Do you need me to hand it to you to read? No. Okay. So that's what Investigator Perry told you, correct? Correct. And once he said that, you knew, uh-oh, the FBI is here, and they're basically telling me if I tell any more lies, I could be in trouble. Objection, Your Honor, 352. No, no, no. What? 352. Oh. Any more lies, Your Honor? I didn't say it's any. Uh, probative. That's probative, so it's not specific. Ma'am, is that true? I, he asked me, I answered him. He asked, and I told him yes. And actually, Eric Perry said I should have looked through it because there could be a gun in there. And I said, well, I certainly hope there isn't because I didn't look through it. Well, except you said you packed it completely and it was empty. Right. I said, there's no, I'm sure there's not a gun in there. And he said, well, you didn't look through it. Okay, ma'am, isn't it true that you responded to Agent Perry, quote, the last thing that I sent to Bob, oh my God, I sent him this, uh, he wanted his clothes. That's at page 43, lines three through four. It is immediately after the last pack, the last uh, portion I read. Is that what you said? Yes. Once again, did you reiterate to him that all that was inside the package was the clothes? Yes. Ma'am, let me ask you this. Were you aware, I'm asking you if you knew, were you aware at that time that if you had sent Bob Durst that kind of money, that potentially it could be a crime. No. So, you so in your mind you had no reason to deny anything because uh, there was nothing wrong with sending one hundred fifteen thousand dollars hidden beneath clothes and shoes in a suitcase to an alias of another individual. That was your position. You thought that was okay. No alarm bells went off. No. I didn't know there was money, so why did I think I would do something wrong? Okay. As you sit here today, ma'am, hearing this scenario, does it make you say, gosh, that does sound a little suspicious? Objection, 352, Your Honor. Overall. You can answer, ma'am. I, like I said, I didn't know. If there was money in that, no, I wouldn't have sent it. And I certainly wouldn't have sent that kind of money. Or would I have sent it and left it on a counter? Ma'am, <laughs> so my question is, a moment ago you said there was nothing wrong with sending that kind of money, that you didn't know that it was. I didn't know. So then why would you say, had you known, you wouldn't have sent it? That's a lot. That's a lot of money to send through. <laughs> Leave on a counter, or I could have just sent it a different way, in PayPal, or I don't know. I didn't think I would, like I said, I didn't know there was, first of all, I just didn't know. So you, so in hindsight, your takeaway is I could have sent him the 115000 through PayPal. Like anything, right, if he needed money, I would have just sent it. I don't, I didn't ask, I didn't question anything. Okay. Let, let me go on to my next topic, ma'am. How did you find out that Bob Durst had been arrested? Don't remember. Ma'am, on March 18, 2015, at page 54, line 27, to page 55, line 5, you had the following exchange with Agent Perry. When was the last time you had a conversation with him? You responded, oh, um, Saturday. Agent Perry, this Saturday, okay? You respond, Saturday. Agent Perry, so Saturday he was arrested. You respond, yeah. So you had a conversation with him the day he was arrested, correct? You need to answer out loud, ma'am. Uh, yes. So when you said a moment ago you're not even sure that you spoke to him on the day that he was arrested, does that now refresh your recollection? Yes, now that you told me. Ma'am, you have previously said 
when you were interviewed that there is no way that Bob Durst would take off, correct? Correct. Do you now know that statement that you made, that there's no way that Bob would take off? Do you now know that statement to be inaccurate? No. I... So ma'am, I want you to assume for a moment the following. I want you to assume that Bob Durst has stated during his March 15, 2015 interview that he had with myself and investigators that he was fleeing from Houston and that he was planning on going, leaving the country and going to Cuba. Would that statement from Mr. Durst, would that affect your opinion that Bob Durst would never just take off? Would that affect your opinion? Still no. I mean, you might have said that. I really thought, and I still think, that he was coming to New York to see me, what he decided to do after, okay, whatever he told you. But as far as I knew, and I believe him, that he was just going to come meet me in New York. And whatever he decided after that, I don't know. Okay. But. When you found out that Bob Durst had been arrested, you actually yourself attempted to recall the package, correct? Yes. Ma'am. Why would you, so Bob Durst is arrested, and you're going to recall a package that's just full of clothes, why? He's not there, so you just reverse it, come back. Right, so, so the first thing you're thinking when your friend Bob Durst has been arrested is, you know what, I better head down to UPS, and I better get those packages of clothes recalled, correct? No, I didn't head down anywhere. You just do it on the computer, and you just say, return to sender. Ma'am, isn't it true that you knew there was $115,000 in there and you wanted to make sure that that money was not gotten by individuals no. who were not you or Bob Durst? No, I did not know that kind of money is in there. Not know. All right, so you asked that it be recalled. Did the package come back to you? No. Because the FBI, you found out later, they got it, correct? Correct. Did you ever visit, I want to go back to after Bob Durst was arrested, did you visit him while he was in jail in New Orleans? Yes. Did you speak to him on the phone constantly while he was in jail in New Orleans? In New Orleans? Yes. I'm sure we spoke, I don't really know how often. Oh. Yeah. I want you to make an estimate. I think it was one time, five times, 20 times, 50 times. What would be your estimate? I don't know, maybe once a week? Maybe? I don't. You think that was it only once a week? Would it surprise you if it was substantially more than once a week? No. It wouldn't surprise me, but I don't know exactly. Oh, well, let me ask you. Was it fair to say that you and Mr. Durst were speaking very frequently while he was in custody in New Orleans? Okay. Is that yes. right? Yes. And ma'am, did you visit Mr. Durst in New Orleans in June 15, on June 15, 2015? Um, yes. Did you take your son Tommy with you? Yes. Did you guys drive down Tommy's very expensive $30,000 second car? No. No. By the way, what car did Tommy get with the thirty grand? We didn't get it. You didn't get it. No. Uh, so why did you take your son Tommy down to visit Bob Durst? Tommy was moving to Louisiana, and Tommy knows Bob. Right, and okay. Tommy's hit Bob up for money through you, correct? Tommy's never asked me to ask Bob for anything. Wait a minute. I thought that part of the reason you got money from Bob Durst had Yes, to but Tommy did not ask me, ever. So you just me. decided that you would hit up Bob for Tommy, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so you visit uh, Bob in Louisiana, is that correct? Um, I want to ask you, during your conversations with him, either in person or on the phone, did you wow, oh, wow, 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 wow. This uh, prosecutor really is driving a stake through this witness. So you could see that the stress on her face, uh, the common sense of it. Good questioning by the prosecutor, uh, communicating a story to the jury. Uh, Gigi, 
you've been on this from the beginning. Now, I'm being told by the producers, and of course, we don't know everything went on in the case, but that there's no immunity here. Uh, the statute of limitations doesn't apply because she's testifying right now, and the prosecutor's literally accusing her of both state and federal crimes with the state transportation of that money. I mean, I, I just, for the life of me, I, how is the, a defense lawyer not stopping this? She has rights. Absolutely, she has rights. And I'm surprised that it's this testimony has been going on for as long as it's been going on. And, you know, the fact that the defense attorney and her attorney aren't jumping out of their chairs trying to get this to stop is beyond me because she's really setting herself up for some serious crimes, if not perjury, if not obstruction of justice and potentially, you know, a, a wire issue, a, a wire crime. So uh, she's definitely cooking herself in, into a very, very uh, hot bath here, Bob. Yeah, uh, Paul Townsend is with us, criminal defense lawyer. Great to have you back on the show, Paul. Uh, let's jump right to it with you. I mean, all right, let's, uh, you know, there was a lot of pretrial motion practice. We don't know whether there was a grant of immunity or not. We're being told that at least we don't know there was a grant of immunity, which would, would protect her with regard to her Fifth Amendment rights if she testifies about something that could implicate her in a crime. Nevertheless, let's put that aside. Substantively, though, this does not look good. $150,000 in a suitcase with a bunch of clothes piled up on it, and the prosecutor making the point that after Durst gets arrested, not only is she having constant contact with him, but she recalls that, and she said she recalled it for his clothes. That was one of the first things he did, and the prosecutor making, of course, the rhetorical, fl rhetorical flourish. Oh, it wasn't to get that $150,000 communicating to the jury. She's not worthy of belief. Just take a look at her on the stand. I mean, at least from the standpoint of what the prosecutor's doing with this witness, she's, she's getting hammered yeah I, she certainly is and i'm coming in kind of in the middle of this so i'm just starting to see where she's being taken by lewin but he certainly is really making a strong point with her and her her answers regarding this money that was mailed and then returned to her uh, are just not credible and lewin is really uh, as you say, digging a stake through it and putting his own flourish on and showing the jury that this is this is nonsense testimony that she is putting forth. And and I completely agree with the idea that it, you know, she, if she has an attorney in the courtroom who is not jumping up and down trying to stop this, then I sincerely hope for her sake that pretrial something was hashed out, granting her immunity for this, because it's it's malpractice to allow your client to sit up on the stand and testify to what could be wire fraud, what could be mail fraud, or a litany of other federal crimes uh, for transporting what could be, you know, the proceeds or instrumentalities of crime through the mail. So I, I think Lewin, mm -hmm. in this case, is really making some solid points. He's connecting with the jury. He's showing them his narrative. And I think this witness, as you as you say, is really floundering. And that's only mm. compounding the efficacy of what Lewin is doing. Yeah. And, and listen, I was the first to say in the beginning of this, relevance is important in the case. So not only is he hammering her, this testimony is, in fact, relevant. So uh, stay with us. We're going to take a quick break and come back with more of this fascinating testimony. Thank you. All right, welcome back. My name is Bob Bianchi. So we've just really had some compelling testimony from Robert Durst's longtime friend, Susan Giordano, actually fist pumping one another when the lawyers were at sidebar with the judge. Uh, obviously, the jury seeing that she's on the stand and she is getting hammered by the prosecutor who called her as a witness with regard to some nefarious activity, actually accusing Ms. Giordano of being an aider and a better in Mr. Durst's attempt to flee the criminal justice process. They're on a real quick break right now, just a short break, 15 minutes or so. And so it gives us an opportunity to talk to our great guests about some things. You know, Gigi, I, I, in the back of my mind, when I was listening to um, the prosecutor eviscerate uh, this witness with respect to putting uh, clothes and, and, and shoes in a suitcase at the request of Robert Durst, uh, because he needed to get clothes quickly and that she didn't know that there was $150,000 in cash with multiple envelopes. And then she wanted to recall it after he got arrested. And on and on we can go. You could see her just shaking her head, the stain. She was getting caught. Everything would tell us that the jury's looking at her as not being, in my mind, a credible person. But is Susan Giordano the Susan Berman 2.0? All right. In other words, these, these women 
that are attracted to Robert Durst for whatever reason they are, that go to great lengths at assisting him cover up his wrongdoing. If you were a prosecutor, or if you were as a defense lawyer, would you be anticipating prosecutors to say, that's what got Susan Berman killed, and Susan Giordano was next in line to help him cover up his crimes? Just a thought, something that popped into my head. It's definitely a hot thought, Bob. And, uh, you know, it's really hard not to draw that conclusion. And I'm sure that if Robert Durst ends up being convicted in this case and she ends up facing charges for her testimony here today, uh, that's going to be part of the defense's strategy is that she was attracted to this manipulating, calculating man who takes women and uses them for his nefarious crimes. You know, that's really the way to spin it. But the prosecutor here is doing an excellent job at tearing this witness down and the way he asks his questions. Is it reasonable to believe you genuinely didn't know there was $150,000 in this suitcase that you packed? And for her to come back and say, well, it was dark inside, it destroys her credibility. She is not having a good time on the stand today. Yeah, Paul Townsend, let me ask you, uh, you know, with respect to that, we also know in this case, and it'll come out before the jury, that 65 approximately boxes of materials were found in the home of Ms. Giordano's parents uh, that were of Mr. Durst's uh, materials. So, I mean, clearly the inference the prosecutor is going to try to draw here is that she is an active participant in him trying to cover something up and that that money is being used for him to be able to get himself out and over to Cuba. How damning is this kind of evidence in your mind? I think it's extremely damning because one thing that Lewin has been trying to do over and over again in this case is show that Robert Durst is the type of person who does these things. And we know his relationship with Susan Berman. The allegation is that she helped him cover up the death of his first wife, Kathy, and that you know what got her killed was going along with the scheme and participating and helping him and aiding him. And now Lewin is basically showing the jury, but he's just repeating this pattern over and over again. And now he has Susan Giordano doing for him what Berman did for him with regard to Kathy Durst. So I think it's extremely compelling. I think the jury is likely eating it up because Lewin has finally latched on to something concrete to show them that all of this, uh, you know, lead in is relevant because right. basically without saying it, what he's saying is Robert Durst has a pattern of using women to commit murder. Or, or to cover it up uh, at a minimum. That's that's what I think the allegation would be. Gigi, real quick, I'm curious about your thoughts about this money and that conversation that Durst, they have recorded between Durst and Susan Giordano, where if I give you that $30,000 for the car, you know, you're quote unquote a hostile witness. To me, if I were a prosecutor, I'd be arguing these are the manipulations going on in this guy's head. He's thinking all along about witnesses and hostile witnesses, and she gets $350,000, ultimately $30,000 for his son's car that, that apparently was never paid and the kid never got the car. I mean, basically, this is the same kind of thing. He uh, lures them in in a certain way, gets them to do certain things, and in the end analysis, not too bad because you get a little something-something in terms of dollars in your account. Absolutely. It, do it goes to show how manipulative and how calculating he is. And the fact that he even frames it, look, they're going to try and make it look like you were bribed here, but I've been giving you money. I've been giving you lots more money than before this case started. <laughs> so what's another 30000 and that induces her to trust him. And yeah, you've always supported me. You've always been there for me. Why wouldn't I be here for you now? It's not a bribe. This is how we are. We take care of each other. And it just you know, goes to show how manipulative he can be over these women. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, and you know, another interesting thing about this, uh, uh, Paul and Gigi, is uh, the questioning that the prosecutor was asking her, and again, they're on a short break right now, so we have an opportunity to play it, about whether she knew about his plans to flee. Let's take a listen. We were talking about, a moment ago, the issue of Mr. Durst telling you that he was uh, fleeing. Do you recall that line of questioning? I recall. So, ma'am, you have seen the New Orleans interview. You have watched and reviewed that interview that myself and investigators did with Bob Durst. It's about two hours and 47 minutes in New Orleans on March 15, 2015. You've seen that, correct? No. You've never viewed that at all? Nobody said 
anything to me, no. Well, ma'am, you're right. aware that it was uh, deeply covered in the national media, et cetera. You're saying you never uh, saw it. Objection, Your Honor, 352. Uh, no. <clears throat> Sustained. Ma'am, so is it your position as you sit here today, you have no knowledge of Mr. Durr's statements regarding what he was doing and where he was going after he left Houston? Is that your position? Yes. The, yes. So, ma'am, let me ask you something. When Mr. Durst asked you to send down, quote, his winter clothes, did you say, hey, Bob, why don't you just buy some clothes there? No. Did, did it seem strange to you that a multimillionaire like Mr. Durst was going to have you go to his house, pick up suitcases, and uh, send them down to him? Did that seem strange to you? No. And it's your position that at the time he told you this, that he was supposed to be coming to New York? I'm sorry, can you just repeat that? I was just thinking of the shoes, <laughs> sorry. Ma'am, didn't you say that Mr. Durst told you that he was supposed to be coming to New York to see you? Yes. If he was going to be coming to New York to see you, ma'am, why wouldn't he just get his winter clothes when he got there? I didn't know if he was stopping anywhere along the way, if he was driving, uh, maybe he was stopping in, I don't know, another state. <laughs> that's close to the East Coast, I didn't question it. You, you didn't question it? And I figured if he needed anything, you could buy, but you don't want to buy new shoes because that's always uncomfortable. So I, I, I thought he would want shoes that were comfortable to wear, and I didn't ask him when he was actually going to be in New York. I didn't know, could have been three days, could have been a week later, I didn't ask. Gigi, as a homicide prosecutor, I cannot tell you how many cases I was able to win at trial because the defendant thought that they were the smartest guy in the room when they were being interviewed by law enforcement and they talked and they talked and they talked and they thought they were going to talk their way out of it. And then a little discrepancy between that testimony and somebody else's testimony about fleeing, for example, and where they're going to flee to could break down the case. Now, Robert Durst decided to give these interviews to the Jinx. He decided to give a, an interview in 2015 with Lewin, who's extremely prepared and i have to say gg i'm curious of your opinion had those interviews not occurred the jinx as well as the interview in 2015 with the prosecutor they may not have had a case at all against him thoughts they would not have had a case at all because we know that to be true because the only reason we see robert durst being brought to trial on this case is following the jinx documentary that was really the nail that nailed him into this coffin that he's laying in right now. And if he didn't have the gall to speak to all of these investigators and to cooperate with law enforcement, even though he knows that he is the prime suspect in all of these crimes, he wouldn't be sitting at this table today. So everyone, just please remember to exercise your right to remain silent. Don't talk to cops. Have your lawyer present with you, because what we're seeing here today is the exact reason why you should always have your lawyer present during these interviews and to not go in at all. You know, Gigi, if I have a dime for every single time all week long, people call our <laughs> law firm, and I tell them that because, as the U.S. Supreme Court says, the right to remain silent not only protects the guilty, but the innocent as well. And so, uh, very good advice. We're going to have to take a quick break here on the Law of Crime Network, but we're going to come back. They're going to be back in court shortly, so stay with us. All right, welcome back. They're on a short break. They should be back any second now in what is what I think to be fascinating testimony in this case, the most fascinating I've seen so far in my mind. Uh, Susan Giordano, a longtime friend of Robert Durst, on the stand being grilled uh, by the prosecutor with regard to the information that's very harmful to Robert Durst. A uh, part of that all is being able to pit one witness against the other, those who are to the birds of a feather flock together, and she's saying she did not know that he was going to flee. She would have no idea why he would flee, despite the fact she packed a suitcase, unbeknownst to her. Uh, 
it was empty, she claimed to the uh, agents when they finally got the suitcase. But no, underneath the clothes and shoes she put in the suitcase was $150,000 in various envelopes of cash that she later went back to the uh, store and said, or the UPS or whatever store that was delivering it, please send it back after Robert Durst got arrested. Uh, so the prosecutor really has her on the ropes. But is that the story? Was Robert Durst going to flee or not flee? According to her, no way. Robert Durst gave an interview, though, with this same prosecutor, and this guy's no joke when he asks questions. He's prepared. Let's take a listen to what he said about his plans to stay in the United States. When, when Kathy disappeared, Douglas has said that he knows nothing about anything that happened after Kathy disappeared. Well, that would not be true. And, and he was, he, he and your dad were coordinating the meetings with Ed Wright and Scapetta, right? Yes. Um, you know, what, what's, what's interesting, uh, I, we, we all knew you were going to flee at some point. Um, you know, and, and, and I mean, you can, I mean, I assume that you're not denying that you were in the process of fleeing. I'm not denying yeah. I was in the process. Yeah, right. and, and I think the reason you're not doing it is you know it's obvious there's, there's nothing to do it. Here's what I understand though. If you've known, so you, my understanding is you were waiting. So when, when were you going to be leaving? So you, we got you today. It's, so then you go another way. Why are you still here? How come you're not in Cuba? How come you weren't in Cuba three months ago or a year ago? I don't get it. Well, we, we got to step back. Okay. I had no idea that I was going to need to flee. I had made arrangements. I had considered the possibility. I had looked here and looked there. But I had never really said, you know what? They're going to come after me. I've got to get far away where they can't get me. And I've got to do this, this, and this, and go over there. I, I never got that. I liked living in Houston. Paul Townsend, I mean, th this was, I, I think it's more critical than the jinx, you know, scenario here with the manner in which the prosecutor step-by-step step eviscerated him during this interview. Because we all know in most jurisdictions in, 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 this, in the country, I don't know of any that doesn't do it, at the end of the case, they read the jury the law. And part of the jury charges, as they call it, is that flight can be considered uh, by them as consciousness of guilt, of evidence of guilt. And here this man is sitting there telling him about his contemplation of fleeing. I, I, for the life of me, I get a lawyer can only lead the horse to water, can't make it drink. But I mean, if this lawyer is anywhere near any, the most incompetent lawyer would have advised him not to give this interview to prosecutors. And if the client insists on doing it and you're listening to what's coming out, I mean, that's time to go home and just like crawl in the bed and suck your thumb day. Yeah, right? I, we've we've had this conversation about this particular interview before and, and it, every single time you watch it, you just cringe because Durst clearly thinks that he's talking his way out of this and that he is so charming and that he is so believable and that the things that he are say that he is saying is bringing Lewin onto his side. But when you actually sit and watch, you are watching Lewin, who is extremely prepared and leads him down the exact path that he knows he wants to go. And he he is setting up this trial. And one of the really interesting things when you watch the video is noting just how believable Durst actually is when he's answering these questions. When he's talking about his preparations and I looked into things and I didn't know I was going to have to flee and I like living in Houston, all of what he's saying has the hallmarks of believability. And so when the jury sees that versus, say, the testimony of Susan Giordano, who's flustering and who's looking side to side and is never really quite sure of where her eyes are supposed to be or her hands, and you can't really see her face because of the mask, but her eyes are darting and they're fleeting, that is showing that when Durst is talking about fleeing, he means it. And when Giordano is talking about not having any idea that there was $150,000 in a suitcase, she's not being honest. And I think Lewin is really going to be hammering in his summation the credibility 
of just in the video versus the incredibility of all the witnesses that are testifying on his behalf. And I, and I think it's going to be very powerful. Gigi, my career has been split up pretty much 50-50 with being a prosecutor and a homicide prosecutor in particular and doing criminal defense work, which I do now. And in all the years I've done criminal defense work, we are so careful that they don't give a statement, not only to law enforcement, to anybody, uh, whether or not an insurance company calls and says, oh, we'd like a statement about the accident or whatever. No, no, and no. And I have never had a client, never, who has not followed my advice. But I think if I did have a client that didn't follow my advice, it would literally be a shouting match in a room, especially walking through a door on a case like this with a prosecutor like we have here who is uber prepared. And of course, Gigi, you can always stop the interview. You can always assert and reassert your right to remain silent. What do you think, as an experienced criminal defense lawyer, second generation criminal <laughs> trial attorney, what do you think was the dynamic that went on here? Was he just unstoppable, Durst? I think he's completely unstoppable. I mean, look how far back his uh, cooperation with law enforcement goes. He's been talking to cops since the 80s. There is no stopping this man. I think the defense attorneys definitely had moments where they're shaking him in his chair, like, please stop talking to cops. But this man's going to keep doing it. There's no stopping him. And I got to say, Bob, you are really lucky. I've had clients that I have told them to their face, do not talk about your case to anybody, not your mom, not the cops. Nobody. And what do they do? They go and talk about their case. And then I have to give them the old shakedown. But I feel like in this in this case, these defense attorneys have gone up to here with Robert Juris asking him not to talk about this case. And I feel like at this point they're saying, see, told you so. Are you going to listen to us now? I hope that's what's happening at least. Yeah, my feeling has been, in my experience, that the reason for this is when you have high-profile clients, they're catering to the court of public perception, too. And that pushes them to want to have their story out so that they can look better. And that's the trap that they fall into. And I think that that's probably what went on here. They are live in court. Let's go through it. And I don't care about the time. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. Has he ever expressed concern to you that Nick Chavin might bury him with evidence in this case? No. Has he ever expressed to you any concern that Nick Chavin has incriminating evidence that might impact him in this case? No. Did you ever tell Nick Chavin that the defense wanted to know what Nick Chavin had said to me? No. Did you ever tell Nick Chavin that the defense was determined to find out what he was going to say in court? No. Did you ever tell Nick Chavin that Bob's lawyers had told you that they wanted to know if Nick knew that Bob was being extorted by Susan? No. Do you have any knowledge of Bob Durst being extorted by Susan? No. Have you ever said to Nick that Bob is, quote, sick to death that Nick is going to say something to the prosecution that is very bad for him, unquote? No. Have you ever said anything similar like that to Nick Chavin at all? No. Me meaning ever involving any concern that he's going to share information that he has that is damaging to Mr. Durst? No. Did you ever tell Nick Chavin that he was the most pivotal, important witness in this case? No. And ma'am, are you aware of the questions that I just asked you? Have you been asked those before? No. Ma'am, do you recall that on February 15, 2017, page 81, line 27 to page 82, line 27, that I asked you the identical questions in court? You don't remember that? No. All right. Have you in any way ever discussed the case involving Susan Berman, Kathy Durst, or Morris Black with Nick Chavin? The case itself, no. Now I'm asking what you've discussed. What have you said to Nick? You said the case itself. What have you said to Nick regarding Bob Durst, Susan Berman, Morris Black, or Kathy Durst? Your Honor, foundation, please, and time frame. What? Also <laughs> cumulative as well. A rule. 
you understand my question? I do. It's 25 years that I know Nick, 30 years. But uh, I told him the last time we spoke that um, Nick said, actually, Nick called me. Ma'am, I, I want to. I'm not asking what I, Nick said to you. I'm asking what did you say to Nick Chavin? I, well, Su Susan Giordano on the witness stand, getting hammered away by the prosecutor. We're going to take a quick break here at the Law and Crime Network, and we'll be right back. All right, Susan Giordano still getting grilled on that witness stand. Uh, during the break, we find out prosecutors is sarcastically saying from 1987 to 2000, she claimed that she had no conversations with Robert Dest Durst, who she indicated was his best friend and wanted to have a love nest with about the disappearance of his wife. They spoke about lots of other things like vacations and things that he went on, but never about her disappearance. Um, and that was not strange to her and that they never had a conversation about Susan Berman's murder. Prosecutors saying with all these conversations, all this correspondence, all this time, you guys aren't talking about any of that stuff. Does that sound reasonable to you? Him asking Ms. Giordano. Let's go live to court cooperation and his testimony in this case? Oh, no. Did you, in fact, call him numerous times prior to his testimony in 2017 to tell him that he should talk to Bob's lawyers? It's a yes or a no question. I'm going to say yes. And did you ever, ma'am, did you ever make those inquiries at Bob Durr's direction? No. So how did you know anything then about what Nick Chavin might or might not know that you are asking him to call Bob's lawyers? Why? Nick called me. Nick would try to contact me, and he told me that we need to help out our mutual friend, exact words, had nothing nice to say about the prosecution and that he had to help out. We had to get together to help out our mutual friend. And I told Nick it was better that we don't speak. Okay. Just that he should speak to the defense. And you're aware, ma'am, are you aware that Nick Chavin came in and testified in his hearing in February of 2017, among other things, that Bob Durst confessed to the murder of Susan Berman? You're aware of that, correct? I am aware of that. All right. I want to ask you, did you ever tell um, Nick Chavin that Bob's lawyers were aware that he and Bob had seen each other in the year before uh, Bob was arrested and that they wanted to know what Nick and Bob had talked about? No. So. Did you ever say to Nick that Bob's lawyers told you that they were aware that Bob and Nick had seen each other in the last year and they wanted to know what you guys talked about? Did you ever say that to Nick? No. Now, you're now aware, ma'am, that there was a dinner that Nick Chavin has testified about where Bob Durst confessed to him, correct? Yes. But you're saying you never brought that up to Nick Chavin. No, Nick Chavin called me. That's ma'am ma from that dinner. It's a yes or no question. You know, uh, Paul, just going uh, to this again. I mean, she is just getting hammered. And what I really like about the prosecutor style, let's talk about it. Um, while sometimes we can argue about what's relevant or not, or they're going too far or not, whether the jury says they've got nothing or not, the fact is, I mean, this dude is prepared. I mean, he knows the page numbers the line numbers. He's basically, you knew he was quoting something when he was saying, did you ever say, did you say this? And he, he goes, well, that was what you said back a couple of years ago. And she's like, oh, I don't remember that. Um, I mean, he's just really taking it to town here. But what do you think about this whole uh, Shaven discussion, which is Durst's friend? And how damaging is that And in terms of how he's crossing this witness about it? About it? I think it could wind up being very damaging. You know, when you're a prosecutor conducting a trial and you have multiple witnesses testi testifying on behalf of the defense, 
being able to show the discrepancies in their testimony can be a very powerful thing for the jury because ultimately you're going to make the argument that they're only here because they're helping out their friend or you know there's some external motivating thing beyond just giving the truth so if you can show that person A testified one way, mm -hmm. say Nick, and person B, Susan, testified a different way, then both of their testimonies, to the extent that they help Rob Durst, uh, right. are, are null and void. Gabriella, GG, my friend, I know you got to go. You get the final word, 30 seconds. Let me tell you, uh, Lewin is very prepared. And at the beginning of our conversation, we we're asking ourselves, where is this going? How is this relevant? Uh, what is the purpose of this testimony? And now, two hours later, the tides have completely shifted. Uh, this witness is getting absolutely pulverized here, and it's definitely harming the defense. All right, Gigi, for this hour, you get the last word. I know you got to go. Thank you very much for being on the show. Paul will be with us. We're going to have a new special guest that's going to be coming up. Again, Susan Giordano on the stand and by all estimations is really building a prosecution case here. We're going to take a quick break here at the Law and Crime Network. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, right, welcome back to For the Record. My name is Bob Bianchi. In case you're following, uh, or just joining us, rather, uh, we have uh, Susan Giordano, who's on the witness stand right now, called by the prosecution in a blistering examination, getting hammered left and right. She's the longtime friend of Robert Durst. Let's go live to court. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes. Okay. Is it, is it Ma'am, is your certainty when you have said no, your 100% certainty, is that the same level of certainty you had when you originally testified today, twice, that those suitcases were empty? Yes. And, and now, ma'am, you've conceded that, in fact, you were wrong about the suitcases being empty, correct? Argument out of your honor. 352. Did you ever say to Nick Chabin that Bob's lawyers wanted to know what side Nick was on? No. Did you ever get any information, ma'am, from any source that Susan Berman was, quote, extorting Bob Durst? No. Did you ever did you ever ask Bob Durst anything about Susan Berman extorting him for money? No. So if Nick Chavin is testifying that you mentioned Susan Berman extorting Bob Durst for money, you have no knowledge of that. Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Sustained. What was that? Sustained. Your Honor, I'm not asking for no. the it's not for the truth of the matter asserted. It, 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 the question is, I'm not asking, the question is not whether it's true, it's whether, in no, fact, it was I, asked. What, what, Hold on. It's also an argument, Your Honor. Certainly not hearsay, and it's not Hold argument. Hold on. Hold on. No, your argument. Objection sustained. Your Honor, may I go sidebar and explain the question? Yes. <clears throat> and Your Honor, can, can you read the, the question as, it, as it's phrased? I don't have it in front of me. So when I go to sidebar. If Nick Chavin is testifying that you mentioned Susan Berman extorting Bob Durst for money, you have no knowledge of that. Yes. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> All right, joining us here at the Lone Crime Network for the record for the last hour of my show is Mike Corbanix, a certified criminal trial lawyer in the state of New Jersey, a law and crime legal analyst, and we came up as baby prosecutors together in the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate being on. Yeah, so listen, hey, Mike, uh, we were talking offline a little bit, and you, you had listened to the testimony from the day before, 
and weren't really up necessarily on the testimony today. And you were saying the same thing that Gigi and myself were saying earlier, uh, that what is the relevance of the testimony? But since yesterday and now developing today is testimony that Durst is asking her to pack a suit suitcases for him. And in the suitcase, one of those suitcases where she put clothes and shoes are envelopes of money up to $150,000 that were in there that she claims, well, I didn't see anything when I opened it up. It was just completely empty. Sent those suitcases to, to uh, I think, one of the suitcases in a pseudonym. And then uh, when a Durst got arrested, asked to have the suitcases brought back by the carrier. Uh, the prosecutor really hammering her credibility, visibly distraught on the witness stand with regard to it. In fact, accused her of aiding and abetting um, the flight of Robert Durst. One of the questions that we have is we're being told, Mike, that there's no immunity given, that um, Ms. Giordano's testimony, her lawyer, had objected to giving because of Fifth Amendment rights to remain silent. Prosecutor countering when she gave her deposition testimony in 2017, the statute of limitations is run. And we just kind of been kibitzing here. But we, maybe we don't have all the facts right. But she is basically sewing herself into potential federal and, state, and state charges. And what would you do as a defense lawyer if you were sitting in that courtroom and your witness is getting hammered and potentially sewing herself into a federal and state conviction? Well, it's just this whole witness is, is is very difficult because I, I don't see how you how you can waive your Fifth Amendment privilege if even if a statute of limitation runs, it I would think you need an order of immunity, but right. it appears that that really doesn't have much say in this case. But you know, like we said, Bob, we hear rulings that sound great today because we're at this court or appellate division, but by the time they get to a Supreme Court. They could be reversed. Yeah, I mean, this one, though, Paul, a, a, a little different because, yes, what Mike is saying is that you could introduce evidence, like in the Cosby case, that later could be seen tainted, violative of the evidence rules. But what we're talking about here is a constitutional right to remain silent of a witness. And, and again, we maybe we don't know all the facts, but what we're being told is, okay, what the prosecutors can do is that they can either right now she's testifying so she could be perjuring herself the, the, the prosecutors essentially saying she is perjuring herself the prosecutors saying that she was aiding and abetting this interstate transportation of money is a federal problem so the only way that witness gets on the stand is a grant of immunity and if the prosecution doesn't grant immunity anything she says right now can be used against her is that not so Absolutely. And the fact is that this is. No, Paul. <laughs> yeah, Paul, please. No, I, a, absolutely. As you were saying, this this is opening a potential massive can of worms for her. And it's the kind of situation that as a defense attorney, you're hoping and praying that prior to any testimony, even the opening in this case, pre-trial, it was hashed out the limits of what she could testify to. And you hope that there is a grant of immunity. Because what she yep. is testifying to is potentially incredibly damaging and, you know, putting her in jeopardy of the, of the prosecution herself. So you have to hope that the attorney that she has, whose specific job is to represent her rights and her constitutional right. rights to remain silent and not incriminate herself, has secured for her the protections necessary to allow her to testify in this case without slapping irons on her wrists as soon as she walks off the stand. Yeah, I, I just have to presume that has occurred. I really do, because otherwise it is absolute malpractice to allow this to, con to continue. Nevertheless, she is giving substantively awesome information to the prosecution. We're live in court. Let's go to it. Correct me. Yeah, let's go. Uh... All right, Mike, we see the lights of the sidebar. You know, <laughs> obviously, you know, this is what happens when you're jumping back and forth the sidebar. You know something important is, is going on because both one side really wants it and the other side really doesn't want it. Um, so we'll have to wait for that to suss out. But, Mike, yeah, to, you know, to the points here, I mean, the, the flight aspect of this is, is relevant. It, in addition to the interview that we were talking about this before, I'm curious about your opinion, that Durst gave to the prosecutor an extremely prepared, 
very capable. This guy is citing pages and lines in various testimony that's been given throughout this case. He's juxtapositioning one person's testimony versus another person's testimony in his cross-examination. He's got that je ne sais quoi, if you will, in being able to ask questions that he really doesn't care what the answer is because he's making a point to the jury that's sitting there and listening to the question and they're using their common sense and getting what he's getting at. He's summing up if you will, within his questioning. So well, let's go to it. My theory is Durst gave these interviews. Yeah, he's nuts and all that. But many high profile clients that I've prosecuted and many that I represent now as a criminal defense lawyer, I'm able to put the lasso on them and, and keep them from going in. But they're worried about their reputation. They're worried about how they're perceived in public. They're worried about their social circles, okay, as opposed to people in other areas that don't have that level of money and affluence. And this is what often drives them to make statements in order to protect themselves in the court of public opinion, but then puts a dagger in them in the court of law. What are your thoughts on that theory? I think part of it, Bob, is that people don't like to ego. Ego comes in a lot of times here. It's, you know, Many times we have clients or we've, you know, had defendants who who really want to show they're smarter than the uh, than the than the government. They're smarter than the state that's prosecuting them. You know, don't forget a lot of people are put in these situations because they've been thinking they're smarter than everyone along the way. And then when they get caught, they're like, no, I'm gonna show somebody. This is a very this case has got so many different dynamics. It's so intriguing. Yeah, Robert Durst asking her to get a suitcase of clothes that happens to have $150,000 cash and multiple envelopes. Uh, Susan Giordano had an answer for that. Let's take a listen to that clip. Ma'am, do you know what that is? They're envelopes. What's up? They're envelopes. Appear to be envelopes. Oh, I have one behind me. Okay. It's in front of you. Yes. Well, this should be yes. Uh, uh, envelopes. Yeah, yeah, no. I want you to assume, ma'am, mm -hmm. that when that suitcase was open, mm -hmm. underneath the clothes no and the shoes were those envelopes. Objection, Your Honor. What? Grounds? No what? Um, Overruled. I was about to say something, Your Honor, but okay. Tell me again. facts not in evidence, Your Honor. Um, Overruled. Okay. Ma'am? Yes. I want you to assume for a moment that those envelopes contain roughly $115,000, that they were inside the suitcase when the FBI opened it. Yeah, that's what Do I was told. Do you know how that got there? I would assume it was in there. I didn't put it in there. Well, ma'am, you just testified that you took two empty suitcases and you put clothes inside. I did. I just threw everything in. Like I said, my car was running. I was wishing I had video. I was in there for probably three minutes, and I threw some stuff in, and I ran before I would get to it. So, ma'am, let me show I you. There were papers, honestly, in there. I didn't know. I even told the FBI agent that. People's 218, 219, excuse me, ma'am. When you open the envelope, do you see that? Was that in the suitcase when you packed it? did not look through anything. You would not see a fingerprint, a t nothing on there, because I didn't touch anything. 220. We did fingerprint, DNA, there is nothing I touched. It's a lot of cash, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, ma'am, can you explain how roughly $115,000 worth of cash mm -hmm. got into an empty suitcase that you yourself had testified you packed? Like I said, if it was in there and there were papers in there already, I didn't go through any papers. I didn't touch. You could fingerprint DNA, whatever you like. I did not touch those envelopes. Ma'am, that's why I asked you first if they were empty twice. I, I, I didn't. It was dark. I was in his apartment. All right, Mike Corbanek says, a great trial lawyer. You've got to be able to listen with one side of your brain that knows what the case is about and what you want to prove. And the other side of brain, you got to kind of wipe away and leave that for what you think the jury is perceiving and what the jury is understanding based not on what you know, but on what's coming out in the courtroom. Uh, oftentimes, lawyers make that mistake thinking the jury knows what they know, but it's not coming out as evidence. How damning, and by the way, it went on and on and on with this, is it's not about whether you touched it, it's about whether you know about it. That you said these suitcases were empty, and lo and behold, 
For some reason, Dursney closed, multi, he is multi-millionaire, he can get clothes anywhere he wants. And then all of a sudden, these envelopes are covered with some shoes and clothes rattly thrown in there. How damning is that in front of your, your perception from the jury standpoint? Listen, Bob, let's be realistic. How many people in their lives have ever seen $115,000 in cash? Uh, so, you know, that's going to jump out on every juror. That's going to be in there. And listen, this prosecutor is, you know, he is consistent in his rhythm of questions. And you, you almost could see that it's just, he's relentless in it. And she's starting, it appears to really be falling apart, in my opinion, because yesterday, like I said, when I saw her, it wasn't really clear where he was going with this. But today it's coming together, and you can see how he just was consistent on putting pressure and putting pressure. Now he has found openings and questions, and there's this is pretty damning. I, I agree with you. And he also has got that je ne sais quoi factors, I like to call, where it, the manner in which his voice inflections occur, uh, the, the incredulity as he's asking a question is also an art form. Paul. Uh, as far as this money is concerned, as far as all this, I have argued to Gigi, do we think the defense is going to say, look, it's just a quirky guy. He does quirky things. That's been proved beyond all doubt in this courtroom. And the fact is, he believes he's been under pursuit by law enforcement for two decades. And so he wants to flee a persecution as opposed to a prosecution. Thoughts? I think that might be the only avenue they can really take. I mean, they're, they're certainly arguing that he's a quirky guy and he does quirky things like stash money at the bottom of empty suitcases in his closet that may unwittingly find their way to him wherever he is through his friends. But I think, you know, based on the video where he's talking about flight, the, the 2015 interview with Lewin, where he completely concedes that, yeah, I was planning on fleeing. And now we have, you know, money getting mailed to him. I, I think that they, they're they kind of backed into a corner now, having to make the argument mm. that Durst felt that he was just being persecuted and he wanted to, to get away from it, an innocent man trying to avoid being wrongfully convicted. Uh, yeah. Whether or not that's going to, you know, resound with the jury is, you know, a question for them. Yeah, as a prosecutor, I would be saying again that this is Susan Berman 2.0, that this is his MO, getting women to cover up for the crimes that he commits, uh, and that they had this quote unquote love nest that she wanted to have with him, and that he was utilizing that and giving her money for the purposes of covering up the murder of Susan Berman. This witness is not good for the defense. Let's take a quick break here at the Law and Crime Network. We'll be right back. All right, more combative testimony while we were on the break with regard to the prosecutor questioning Susan Giordano with regard to whether she ever knew that Ms. Berman was supposedly extorting Mr. Durst, which she denied that she didn't even know until this day. Prosecutor belying that with other evidence. Uh, she's visibly exhausted, um, exhaling, making sounds, and he's now telling us the prosecutor is going to get into a new area. So let's check it out. How'd you find out about Susan Berman's murder? It was the time, I think, uh, her murder, I really don't remember. It was probably around the time of Morris Black. I, I didn't read it in the paper, and uh, it was sometime after her death. Ma'am, were you aware that Mr. Durst had always, until December 22nd, 2019, denied that he was ever in Los Angeles at the time of the murder? Were you aware of that? Yes. And ma'am, you are now aware that Mr. Durst has said not only was he in Los Angeles at the time of the murder, that the defense in this case is he found the body. Are you yes. aware of that? Yes. Did Mr. Durst ever mention that to you? No. So when you heard that all of a sudden, after always denying for 20 years that he was in Los Angeles, when you heard that he was now saying, hey, I found the body, did you ask him about it? Uh, 
N no. Did that seem strange to you, ma'am, that all of a sudden it was a completely different version of events that he'd been telling you for 20 years? No. Be <laughs> ma'am, you are aware that Nick Chavin and Bob Durst had a dinner in Manhattan in 2014, correct? You're aware that that dinner took place? Yes. And you're aware, and listen to my question very carefully, yes or no, you're aware that that dinner took place because Bob Durst has told you that dinner took place, correct? Nick called me from that place. That's uh, so motion, no, to strike is, motion to strike is non-responsive. Stricken. Ma'am, listen to my question. Has Bob Durst ever confirmed to you that that dinner took place? Yes. Okay. When did you become aware, ma'am, when that Bob Durst had confessed, <coughs> according to Nick Chabin, at that dinner or after that dinner? When did you become aware of that? Um, whenever he was in court. <laughs> Have you ever asked Bob about it? No. Why not? Because Nick's, well, I didn't ask him. It was from um, right. Ma'am. Your Honor, could you yes. ask the witness to answer the question? <laughs> she answered the question. Well, I couldn't actually hear the last right. few things she said. Um, I'm mumbling a little bit. Did no, I, I didn't. Ask him. Thank you. Ma'am, did Bob Durst bring up the idea to you of providing him with a false alibi for the week that Susan Berman was murdered? No. Uh, no. Ma'am? I said it was a misunderstanding because I didn't speak to Bob then, and I it specifically said that he should know, it's hard to know, I didn't know where I was, I said to him on Hanukkah, so I don't know if you would know where you were on Christmas Eve, but we didn't speak to each other until three years later, so he didn't ask. Ma'am, listen to my question. I did not ask you when this happened. Listen to my question. Did Bob Durst ever bring up to you the idea of providing a false alibi for that time by asking you to say that he was with you and your family during Christmas of 2000? No. Ma'am, did you originally volunteer this information during a recorded interview with Jarecki and Smirling on March 15, 2015? Out of context, if I could. Explain. I said, "Ma'am, that's uh, a no, yes or no, no question." No. Did the witness be allowed to answer? No. Okay, yes. ma'am. Did you say to Jarecki and/or Smerlin that Bob had called you from Galveston, told you that he was not with anybody, but that he quote has to be with someone unquote because he was not where everyone thought he was the night of Susan's murder. Did you say that to Andrew Drecki and Mark Smerling? I don't recall that. But ma'am, when you say you don't recall it, I want to be clear. Is your point going to be that I said it, but that I misunderstood, or that that's not what I meant, or are you actually disputing that you said it? You're saying he said, uh, I don't, I really don't recall. I, I don't, I don't recall that conversation. Did, did you tell Mark and Andrew that Bob said to you, I have to still be with someone because it will make it go away at page 31, line seven of the interview? Did you say that? I mean, Bob didn't say that to me. I might have said it, but Bob never said it to me. I... So, what, so what you're saying is, yes, I said it to Mark and Andrew, but when I said that Bob said it, 
that was mistaken. So you're saying I said it, but it was incorrect. Yes. Okay, and let me go back, ma'am, and I assume that you also would agree that you told Mark uh, and or Andrew Jarecki that Bob had told you that he was not with anybody, but quote, has to be with someone during the time of Susan's murder. You agree that's what you said to Andrew Jarecki and Mark Smurley, correct? I might have, yes. I don't... Well, ma'am, when, when you say you might have, but I never spoke to Bob about okay. that. So I'm, I'm not asking what Bob told you now. I'm asking what you said. Did you also tell Mark and Andrew during that same interview that Bob asked you where you were that night and what you were doing during the holidays? No. Did you also tell Mark and Andrew that Bob told you I'm sorry, that you told Bob in response that you were at a large family gathering on Christmas Eve in New York, but that he had nothing to worry about if he wasn't at the scene of Berman's murder. Did you say that to Mark and Andrew? No. Oh, wait, I might have said it out of conversation, but that didn't have a conversation with Bob included in it. No, I might have said to him, yes, because, yes. Okay. Yes. Did you tell Mark and Andrew during that 315-15 interview that you responded to Bob, that you told Bob, quote, to just be with Debbie since it was only a month after they got married? That's at page 31, line 19. Did you I say that? Probably said you should have been with Debbie, so. How could you not be? And it's not the holiday, so. Did you say that? I don't recall. I don't recall. Did you further say, ma'am? <laughs> what was the date of that one? Mr. March. This is all from the March 15, 2015 interview. Six years ago. Yes, that would be six years ago, Mr. Chesson. You told them, correct that Bob told you, sorry, that, you told that, um, that Bob said to you in response to your comment of just be with Debbie, that Bob said that although it was only a month after they got married, that Debbie, his wife, had already told someone that she didn't think Bob was with her that night. Did you say that to Jarecki and Smurley during that interview? I don't remember. Did you tell Jarecki and Smirley that Bob told you that for that reason, he could not say that he had been with Debbie when Susan was murdered? Did you say that? I really don't remember. I don't remember. It was a conversation. It wasn't an interview, so I don't really remember. You were asked about this issue again during your April 18, 2015 interview. Is that correct? Have you ever been asked about that, ma'am? I don't, what well, was April? Where was I in April? Where, I was, I, Having a conversation with myself and investigators at your lawyer's office in New York. Do you okay. recall that, ma'am? Yes, I do. Do you recall that this issue came up during that interview? Yes. I'm going to play SG052. And Your Honor, may we mark that as 224 and 224A? 224, 224A. 224 Do you remember um, telling investigators that you thought it was odd that Bob needed to say he was with someone yeah, on Christmas? If, if, if he didn't kill Susan, there wouldn't be any reason for him to say that. Do you remember telling investigators that? Yeah. Does that refresh your memory, ma'am, about Bob Durst telling you that he needed you, he wanted you to provide him with an alibi? No, he was never involved in this whole thing at all. I said it, my opinion. He and I have never had this conversation. It would have been on a recording in jail. Never, ever mentioned Susan Berman. So, ma'am, I want to go through this. The question is, do you remember telling investigators that you thought it was odd 
that Bob needed to say he was with someone. You responded, yeah, correct? Yes. That question asks you, do you agree, ma'am? It asks you. All right, this woman, Susan Giordano, will never be the same again. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. prosecutor hammering away at Susan Giordano during the break, where uh, she's basically saying in a previous interview that she thought it was odd he needed an alibi, that she couldn't say that he was at a Christmas party with 30 people who knew he wasn't there, versus what she's saying, well, even though it may sound like I was saying Bob was saying those things, it was just really my kind of thinking it up. And then following up lastly with the cadaver note, uh, indicating that Bob had told her only the killer could know who the killer uh, the, would know with the cadaver note. Now asking her, do you know now that he's the one who wrote the cadaver note and now she acknowledges that he does and so therefore what are your thoughts with regard to him being the killer it's brutal let's go back live to court conversation with bob durst on july 31st 2017 in the middle of emily Altman's conditional examination testimony did i have a conversation yes with i'm sorry did you repeat it did you have a conversation with bob durst on July 31st, 2017, which was in the middle of Emily Altman's conditional examination testimony? Uh, maybe. I don't recall the date. Now, isn't it true that you had a call and that during that call, Bob Durst never told you, never admitted that what Emily Altman had said about him being in Los Angeles was true, correct? Correct. We didn't speak about it. And at the time of the call, ma'am, you had been watching Emily Altman's testimony, correct? No, I didn't see her testimony. No, no meaning, I mean, you, I'm saying you've watched it live, but you had been following her testimony, correct? I'm sorry, I didn't. SG 110-731-17 jail call. Your Honor, may we mark this as 226 and 226A? Yes. Let me stop it. I think I gave it the wrong. It should have been SG uh, 110. I'm sorry. I think I said the wrong. I heard Did 110. I Did I say 110? Hold on. You just, you didn't, the audio didn't play on the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> her testimony I, I didn't watch her testimony I just I went online he asked me if I knew and I checked it I didn't see her ma'am um, I just asked you very clearly if I watched no ma'am and then I said did you review the testimony did you read any articles about the testimony and your response was you didn't no I that didn't. wasn't true was it I didn't actually I don't even remember reading anything I probably I it, Somebody probably told me, and I told him I did all this research, and I didn't, but... Uh, so, ma'am, when you're you saying, you're quoting, I went online in the yeah. Los Angeles Times for three days. She kept changing her story. You had a pretty good recollection about her testimony at the time you were having this call, didn't you? I had someone else that seen it and told me I didn't. And at no time during this call, by the way, did Bob Durst say to you, you know what, actually, Emily is right. I was in Los Angeles. I did find the body. He never told you that, did he? 
No, I, no, I. I and in fact, ma'am, his defense at the time was the opposite. He was saying, correct, I wasn't in Los Angeles, I didn't write the cadaver note, and I didn't find the body, correct? Correct. And that's what he has told you, ma'am, consistently for 20 years, correct? Told me, yes, outright, yes. Would it surprise you, ma'am? How do you think that call ended? What do you think you, the last thing you said to Bob was on that call? I don't know. What do you usually say to Bob? I, know, I tell him that I love him. Everything's going to be OK. Everything will be fine. I love you. I miss you. Is that right? Yeah. That's generally how your call. Everything is going to be good. That's generally how your calls end, right? Yeah. Um, you and Bob Durst spoke again on October 18, 2017. Is that correct? Yes. Do you remember Bob Durst telling you what his theory about the trial was going to be? I don't. October 18, 2017. Oh. This is going to be SG 111, People's Next in Order. Your Honor, may I be marked as 227 and 227A? Yeah. reading it, I don't actually recall it, but it's there. And now that you've heard it, ma'am, does that sound like conversations you've had with Mr. Durst? Yes. And ma'am, would you agree that during this exchange, Bob Durst isn't telling you, hey, listen, I didn't do this thing. I didn't kill her. Correct? He's not saying that, is he? No, not outright, no. Those Ma'am, when specifically, to the best of your memory, did you find out that Kathy Durst had disappeared? Was that after or before you expressed interest in dating Bob Durst? Um, after. Well, it was the same time. Right. In an elevator. And, and ma'am, when did you find out specifically about Morris Black's death? The newspaper, I guess. When did you find out that Bob Durst was admitting that he had dismembered Morris's corpse? In the newspaper? At the same time everyone else would find well, out, I guess. When, when you heard that Bob Durst had admitted to dismembering Morris's body, what was your response? Probably the same thing I said on tape with Andrew Jarecki, that what? nobody knows what they're going to do when they're in a situation. So, so I, your, your response to hearing that Mr. Durst had dismembered Morris Black was to say, well, I'm not in his shoes. Who knows what you do? That was your response? All right, Mike, Mike Corbanix, one question here real quick. I mean, I, I don't even know where to begin about the hammering of this witness. I, you, you said it looked like she's going to have a nervous breakdown. I think she just may fall on the sword at a certain point in time. But it is so obvious this prosecutor has completely and utterly destroyed her and really harmed the defense's case. What are your thoughts? I agree. Not only that, Bob, this prosecutor and this witness has gained a ton of credibility because of the fact that he is, through this witness, shown now, anybody who's close to Durst will be manipulated to be in favor of Durst. And this is really how we've seen the whole process go. And she is getting 
she's basically, it looks to me like she's running out of gas. She can't put up the fight anymore. It reminds me of the old adage, open lips, sink ships. And that is what we are seeing right now. We're going to take a quick break here at the Lone Crime Network. We'll be back with more. All right, welcome back on the stand. Susan Giordano being asked questions by the prosecution about the Morris Black uh, dismemberment situation, her giving previous testimony that love is blind and things of that nature. Now the prosecutor getting into all the financial incentives she's had over the many years. Let's go back live to court. Possibly, I don't really think it possibly happened. I didn't think it was, you know, because he doesn't have a mean bone in his body. So as people, I've never seen it ever. Did you say that? That's, yes, I did. Is that your position today as you sit here, that he doesn't have a mean bone in his body and that he's not violent? Yes. Have cool. you seen any of the uh, statements that Bob Durst made in the Jinx about how he would physically and emotionally abuse his wife, Kathy? There was, I, I know from uh, reading a book that he pulled her by the hair. That's really... So, ma'am, you're saying that you only know of one isolated instance of domestic violence involving your best friend and person you want to share a love nest with? I said first. all I know is the, it's what somebody sees. Like, I, I don't know, there's people who have been married and they were terrible people and then they remarry someone and then they're not terrible people. I, it's how he treated me. How he treated me is what I see. I can't say what he did 40 years ago. Right. You uh, never uh, lived with him, basic. correct? Correct. You've never lived with Bob, correct? Correct. Have you ever had a... It, there's no sexual relationship, correct? Correct. So your relationship consists of you and Bob talking, correct? And Bob sending you lots of money. Is well, that right? Somewhere else we go to dinner. <laughs> we spend time together. So okay. it, it's not just like, hi, my name is, send me money. Um, I want to talk about your contacts with Bob's attorneys. Okay. Have you had co repeated contacts with Mr. Durst's attorney? Um, not since, um, I don't know, six, five years ago, I guess. I don't. Really? I mean, whenever well, I was called as a witness, I. You had no contact with his, any of his attorneys since then? Since 2017, when you were called as a witness? Correct. Are you sure? Um, I mean, I would write, they don't write you back. I just wanted to make sure he's okay, but, you know, no one really gets back to me. Did you say during a March 14th, March 4th, 2019 jail call that you mentioned sending, quote, screens to Cat? Who's Cat? Um, it was their attorney. I wanted to send something that Nick sent me, so. One of Bob's attorneys, correct? Correct. So, ma'am, when I just asked you if you had any contacts with his attorneys, and you told me you haven't had any contacts for five years. I thought you meant they contacted me. I kind of reached out. I don't, I just said that. I would also see how Bob was doing, and nobody would get back to me, but I said things that I thought were important. Nick harassing me was important. Ma'am. Did Bob discuss with you the issue of you not providing any damaging information to the authorities? Has he ever done that? No. Has he ever specifically mentioned that my office likely would be in touch to you, with you and that his lawyer, Steve, has told you 27 times that you don't tell them shit? Has he ever said that to you? Uh, no. Who All right, uh, Mike Corbanks, I mean, this is just blistering. Uh, it, it's almost painful uh, to watch. You, the, the, just look at the physicality of the witness shaking her head. I don't. I think she's shaking her head like, why am I here? Gosh, I mean, unbelievable. But let's get to the point that we talk about with clients all the time. Mike, it's not only doing interviews with the jinx. It's not only giving the prosecutor an interview where they're now able to use that against you and pull threads left and right and cross-examine other witnesses. It's the jailhouse calls that are recorded. And you tell your clients all the time, do not speak on a jail phone about the facts of the case because they are being recorded. 
And boy, this prosecutor, he wherever she goes, and this is why I gotta give this guy credit. He's not painting by numbers. She goes here, he knows the citation, he's got the recording from the jail, he's got the transcript of a previous uh, uh, testimony that's been given. Wow, Mike, what are your thoughts? I think this is very impressive, the way he's handling this witness, Bob. And like you said, it's preparation. You know, you have to do all these hours for these kind of questioning, and he's doing a great job. Yeah, Paul, uh, to your uh, final analysis here as we come to the end of at least today my show, but don't go anywhere because it'll be a great show afterwards, as you can see what's going on in court here today. I mean, there are times I've crossed witnesses like this where you get to a point, like you say to yourself, How, well, maybe I should just get out now because it couldn't get much better, and maybe it can get better, right? That's a decision you have to make as a trial lawyer, no? Absolutely, and it's always a, a big consideration of, you know, you want to end on a bang, and the last thing you want to do is... Uh, go into a topic that you think is going to turn out to be something really impressive and it kind of flops and then you're done and the jury, you know, is left with something that's not as impactful as the majority of what was going on. I mean, what we're watching now is Lewin put on a clinic on how to systematically just disassemble a witness uh, on on his own witness, technically, but basically on cross-examination. And it's really just shattering Durst's defense and showing a, just how... Durst is manipulating right, women right. to help him, and it's really making yep. their, their case for them. I agree with you guys completely. You've done an amazing job. Thank you so much for this analysis. Agree completely. Bad day for Team Durst, for sure. Listen, I'm signing off. I'll be back next week, but don't go anywhere. Derek Dennis is next. He's going to carry it through. Have a great weekend.